today uh, we'll discuss about itp uh, which is an autoimmune disease characterized by isolated thrombocytopenia patients may be asymptomatic at the time of presentation or they may present with a mild mucocutaneous to life threatening bleeding uh, this disease was previously known as idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura but uh, nowadays uh, this term is not used because we know the cause uh, which is dysregulation of immune system and purpura might not be present in all the patients and this can be misleading so nowadays the term immune thrombocytopenia is preferred the incidence of itp is estimated to be around 2 to 5 cases per 100000 persons in the general population now moving on to the pathophysiology what we need to understand is the key event in the pathophysiology is production of the antiplatelet autoantibodies so these um, autoantibodies they usually bind to the circulating platelet membranes so basically they bind they are mostly specific to the platelet membrane glycoproteins like glycoprotein 2b3a or glycoprotein 1b9 so these autoantibodies they target the platelets for destruction by the macrophages in the spleen liver or both through activation of the fc receptors and this process is controlled by spleen tyrosine kinase in addition to this the autoantibodies may also inhibit the platelet production by megakaryocytes this results in the shortened life span of the platelets in the circulation and the incomplete compensation by the increased platelet production by bone marrow megakaryocytes and this results in decreased number of the circulating platelets leading to immune thrombocytopenia spleen has a very important role in the pathophysiology uh, the white bulb of the spleen is responsible for the production of the platelet autoantibodies a uh, very red ball is uh, responsible for destroying the immunoglobulin coated platelets similarly cytotoxic cd8 t cells are also responsible for the immune thrombocytopenia and they destroy platelets in the antibody independent mechanism itp can be classified into newly diagnosed itp persistent itp or chronic itp so from the diagnosis up to the 3 months is considered as newly diagnosed and from 3 to 12 months is persistent itp and if, if the itp lasts for more than 12 months it's known as chronic itp similarly itp can also be classified as primary and secondary itp if itp is not triggered by any apparent associated condition then we call it primary itp whereas if it's associated with the other predisposing conditions then we call it secondary itp so some of the causes of the secondary itps include like autoimmune syndromes like antiphospholipid syndrome rheumatoid arthritis sle or sometimes the infections like hiv or even hepatitis c virus and sometimes even the lymphoma or it could be secondary to the use of the medications like gold or some other monoclonal antibodies so for the diagnosis of the itp we need to take a very detailed history and the history should focus on the factors that suggest another disease for which thrombocytopenia is a complication like we need to ask about the recent viral infections in the children Similarly we need to ask about the recent use of the drugs that can cause thrombocytopenia as well as our history should focus on finding the signs and symptoms uh, that differentiate mild moderate and severe bleeding tendencies like a uh, patient can present uh, we need to ask the history about the headache blurred vision somnolence or LOC if you are suspecting intracranial bleeding similarly we have to ask about the bleeding from the other sides of the body and similarly we need to uh, ask about the symptoms like petechi presence of ecchymosis presence of epistaxis or hematuria so on the physical examination we can find the petechi so in this picture or we can find the ecchymosis there can be oozing from the venipuncture site if the platelet is very low patient can present with gingival bleeding or they can have the hemorrhagic bleed or there can be the signs of intracranial hemorrhage like a somnolence confusion pupillary asymmetry or even the hemiparesis or reduced consciousness similarly if the patient has splenomegaly it um, excludes the diagnosis of itp so we should always examine the abdomen to look for the spleen so if the spleen is um, enlarged then the itp is less likely and we need to search for the some other pathologies so the major differential diagnosis for the itp include all other causes of low platelet common differentials include pseudothrombocytopenia which is due to the platelet clumping similarly we have to think about the leukemia a mild cystic marrow infiltration myelodysplasia plastic anemia sometimes even the adverse drug reactions like the use of heparin or valproate or so we have to think about the liver diseases 
diseases like cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and we have to think about the inherited thrombocytopenia as also a differential diagnosis for ITP. Now, let's talk about the diagnosis. We need to understand that ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to exclude all other possible causes of thrombocytopenia. So, in CBC, there can be isolated thrombocytopenia, and if there's anemia or neutropenia, then we have to think of some other diseases as well. We do the peripheral blood smear. In the peripheral blood smear, morphology of the RBC and leukocyte is normal. And the morphology of the platelet is also typically normal uh, with varying number of the large platelets. But large platelets may not be present in all the patients. You can see this peripheral blood film where you can see only one platelet uh, and you can see the normal erythrocytes. So other tests which we can do for the diagnosis are the tests which we do to rule out the other secondary causes of uh, ITP or the other possible causes of thrombocytopenia. So those some of those tests include HIV serology, hepatitis C serology, hepatitis B serology, similarly the PCR for Epstein-Barr virus, parvovirus, even S. pylori testing. Uh, we also sometimes need to do the Coombs test to rule out the Ivan syndrome. Sometimes uh, we need to do the immunoglobulin labels. We have to do the blood grouping. Similarly, we can also do the platelet antigen-specific antibodies, but these tests are non-specific and not recommended for the routine evaluation. Similarly, we can do antiphospholipid antibodies to rule out antiphospholipid syndrome. Similarly, we can do ANA to rule out SLE, autoimmune diseases, and we can do antithyroid antibodies, and we need to test the pregnancy in the uh, women of childbearing potential. So in addition to those blood tests, uh, which can help us in identifying the other possible causes of ITP and to rule out the other causes thrombocytopenia, we might need to proceed for the bone marrow aspiration in, and biopsy in the selected cases. It's usually not done routinely, and if it's done, it will show normal to increased number of the megakaryocytes in the absence of any other significant abnormalities. And the sometimes megakaryocytes may be large, and it's basically used to exclude other uh, diseases like myelodysplastic syndrome or leukemia, and it's usually basically done in the older patients and in those patients who are unresponsive to the standard treatment after six months of the treatment. So you can see and this is a bone marrow in a patient with ITP with good cellularity, normal development of the erythroid and myeloid cells, and increased number of the megakaryocytes. Regarding the imaging studies, CT scan or MRI are indicated when we're uh, when there is suspicion of the bleeding, like intracranial bleeding or a peritoneal bleeding. So now let's move to the treatment. So we'll discuss about the treatment in detail. So in children, most of the cases are mild and self-limited. However, what we need to understand is ITP has no cure and relapses may occur years after seemingly successful medical or surgical treatment. Corticosteroids are the drug of choice for the initial management of the ITP and the response rate with the treatment is around 60 to 80 percent and about uh, 30 to 50 percent of the patients they have sustained response after discontinuation of the steroids. So the commonly used steroids include prednisolone, methylprednisolone, or high dose dexamethasone. Prednisolone is usually given in the dose of one to two milligram per kg for one to two weeks, and it's followed by the gradual tapering. But if the patient doesn't show any response to the treatment, uh, steroids can be rapidly tapered and stopped. Similarly, the dose for the dexamethasone is 20 to 40 milligrams per day for four days, and it can be repeated up to three times. So after the use of oral steroids, the initial response occurs in around two to 14 days, and the peak response can be seen in four to 28 days. Uh, in some patients who need the aggressive treatment, these steroids can be combined with RH immunoglobulin as well as the IVIG. And in the emergency situation, we can replace oral oral steroids with IV methylprednisolone. Our next first-line agent which can be used is the IV immunoglobulin. Uh, it is the drug of second choice and uh, what it does is it induces decreased function of the mononuclear macrophages so that uh, it prevents the splenic destruction of the platelet. So it's uh, used whenever there is a need to increase the platelets rapidly. Uh, the dose is usually one gram per kg on one or two consecutive days or it can be given at 0 0.4 grams per kg every day for five days. So Initial response is seen in one to three days, and the peak response is at around two to seven days. Mm -hmm. The adverse drug reactions mostly associated with IVIG include headache, aseptic meningitis, and rendered failure. So this medicine should be used very cautiously. So the next medicine which can 
uh, used is the RHO immunoglobulin or RH immunoglobulin. So these are the immunoglobulin products manufactured from the pool of the plasma from the RH negative persons and aluminized to the D blood group antigen. It induces an immune hemolysis in RH positive persons and the dose is around doses from 50 to 75 microgram per kg once. Important thing which we need to understand is it should not be used in patients with whose hemoglobin concentration is less than 8 and it can cause the side effects like uh, intravascular hemolysis, disseminated intravascular coagulation and kidney failure and uh, this is not effective in RS negative person or in those patients who have undergone splenectomy. Platelet transfusion has limited role in the management of ITP. Uh, it can be used uh, if it's required to control the significant bleeding, but it's not recommended for the prophylaxis. And these uh, transfused platelets have decreased circulation time, so they are not effective in increasing the platelet. And the repeated transfusions can lead to the platelet aluminization. So platelet transfusions should not be used unless it's indicated. If these first-line treatment are not effective and the patient is steroid dependent or unresponsive to the steroid. A patient can be treated with other agents like thrombopoietin receptor agonists, rituximab, or splenectomy. So we'll discuss about these second-line treatments in detail. So first of all, we'll discuss about this uh, thrombopoietin receptor agonist. Uh, there are currently three thrombopoietin receptor agonists, romiplostim, um, L-thrombopag, and evathrombopag. So we'll discuss about each of them. So this romiplostim, it comes in injections, and it's usually given by the subcut injection. Dose is 1 to 10 microgram per kg once a week, and it increases the platelet count within 5 to 8 days, uh, with uh, levels returning back to the baseline after 28 days. So the response is achieved and maintained in around 40 to 60 percent of the patients receiving the continuous therapy. It's not indicated in the pregnancy unless uh, there are no other treatment options. And the adverse drug reactions basically include headache, muscle aches, and the possible increased risk of thrombosis and myelofibrosis. The next thrombopoietin receptor agonist is l thrombopack So it is indicated for the treatment of chronic ITP in patients one year of age or older who have not achieved an appropriate response with other medical therapy or splenectomy. This is an oral agent. And the dose is um, 25 to 75 milligram orally daily, and uh, it must be taken in the empty stomach. Usually, the platelets uh, start to increase after the eight days of daily dosing. Some of the side effects include thromboembolic events, or there is increased bilirubin labels. Sometimes it can cause cataract and myelofibrosis. And the next agent is about thrombopack. It is an oral TPO receptor agonist. It was approved by FDA in 2019 for the adults with chronic IDP who had an insufficient res response to the previous treatment. The dose is 5 to 40 milligrams orally daily and it can be taken with the food. This is a good a big advantage and the onset of action is around one to two weeks and the common side effects include headache, arthralgia and the possible increased risk of thrombosis. Next medicine which can be used as a second line treatment for the ITP is rituximab. So it is the most widely used immunomodulator. However, it's not approved by FDA for use in ITP. And dose is usually 375 milligram per uh, meter square of body surface area uh, which is given weekly for four weeks or now we can use the one gram dose twice with two weeks uh, between the doses. So the response is usually observed within the one to eight week. And the main advantage with the use of rituximab is patient can have sustained response for more than two years. And if the patient relapses on rituximab, they can be again retreated with the rituximab and they usually show the response. Uh, but there are some notable side effects of the rituximab like infusion related side effects like chills uh, or bronchospasm uh, and it can also cause neutropenia or serum sickness. Similarly, there is increased risk of infections and the progressive multiple focal leukoencephalopathy. A newer drug which can be used for the ITP is Postamatinib. It is a oral spleen tyrosine kinase inhibitor and it was approved by FDA in 2018 for the thrombocytopenia in adults with chronic ITP who had an insufficient response to the previous treatment. The dose is 50 to 150 milligram orally twice daily and onset of action is around one to two weeks. Almost 18 to 43 percent of the patients they achieve and maintain the uh, response and the common adverse effects include hypertension hypertension, nausea, diarrhea, and transaminitis. There are some other immunomodulators which have been used in ITP, and they include mycophenolate, mofetil, azathioprine, dapsone, and danazole. And these agents can be used as a second-line agent in selected group of patients. And the next important part of the treatment of ITP is the splenectomy. So this is the second-line option for the adults uh, who have had ITP for longer than 12 months. We need to wait for 12 to 24 months because many uh, adults with ITP can go into remission in that period of time. So we need to wait for 12 months before considering the splenectomy. So this splenectomy is associated with long-term treatment-free remission. So that's a good thing. But there is a 
increase the risk of sepsis from the infections by the capsulated bacteria like streptococcus pneumoniae and with the organisms like babesia moreover splenectomy is also associated with increased risk of venous and arterial thrombosis uh, increased risk of cardiovascular events and even the increased rate of the pulmonary hypertension so splenectomy should be uh, used for the selected patients only so this chart shows the management of the itp in the adults first we need to look whether the patient is bleeding or not and we need to look at the platelet count if the platelet count is low and if the platelet patient is bleeding actively we have to decide whether the patient bleeding is severe or just a mild bleeding if the bleeding is severe then we have to immediately manage the patient the patient might require iv steroid ivig rh immunoglobulin but if the bleeding is minor and the platelet is less than 50000 or if the platelet is uh, if the patient is not bleeding but the platelet is below 20000 to 30000 then the initial therapies include glucocorticoid and ivig or ntd then we can observe for the improvements if there's improvement then we can observe and monitor the patient however if there's no improvement the following dose treatment then we have to go for the second line treatments like rituximab tpo receptor agonist or splenectomy and if the platelet count is more than 30000 most of the times patient can be just observed uh, this chart shows the second line treatment for the immune thrombocytopenia what we need to understand is the second line treatment basically depends upon the choice of the patient and the underlying comorbidities so if the patient wants the definitive curative therapy uh, but they don't want to take medication for a long period of time a uh, patient can go for the splenectomy if they fulfill the criteria whereas if the patient is willing to avoid the effects of splenectomy or the immunosuppression because of the rituximab then patients can go for the tpo rs so now let's talk about the management of itp in pregnancy uh, basically during the time of delivery so in the pregnant women with no bleeding manifestation whose platelet counts are 30000 or higher they usually do not require treatment until the 36 weeks of gestation unless delivery is imminent and if the platelet count is below 30000 or clinically relevant bleeding is present first line therapy is usually oral corticosteroids or ivig and if the platelet count is greater than 50000 and if there's a risk of uh, bleeding is low patient can be started on oral prednisolone a uh, week before delivery and it's a reasonable precaution however if the platelet count is is less than 50000 before delivery uh, treatment with oral prednisolone or ivig is usually recommended and uh, in pregnancy it's better to avoid rh immunoglobulin and the splenectomy may be required in some patients to manage the acute hemorrhage to manage the refractory itp in the pregnancy uh, we can combine corticosteroids with ivig or patient can undergo splenectomy in the second trimester however the third line agents like uh, this immunomodulators are not recommended in the pregnancy but they have been used uh, in the certain situations but they should be used very cautiously now let's talk about the target platelet counts for the procedure and the surgery for the simple dental procedures like the deep cleaning or the scaling platelet counts more than 20000 is um, usually safe and for like complex extractions platelet counts uh, need to be more than 50000 and for the surgeries like for the minor surgery platelet count is usually maintained above 50000 and for the major neurosurgery platelet count should be more than 100000 and for the major surgery it should be above 80000 talking about the prognosis in children the prognosis is good more than 80% of the children they usually uh, develop uh, spontaneous recovery without any treatment however in the adults many adults they tend to develop the chronic itp but up to one third of the patients may remit in one year and up to 80% may remit in five years So these are the references which we used for making our video. Thank you so much for watching our video. Please subscribe to our channel for more videos.